We are live. Welcome to O5's Good Night and Good Luck Review and Thoughts Film. I realize this video is long, but if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is fairly comparatively short. At least that's the idea. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. So I start this video with a review. Most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so that you can mute and skip ahead. Let's see. And... Yes, so, plot. 1953, The Red Scare. During McCarthyism, one brave journalist, broadcast journalist Edward R. Murrow, uses his platform to spread the truth about all the problems with McCarthyism. Now, this isn't really a movie that's mainly about its plot, which is minimal, its characters, which are giving little development. It's about the fight that it depicts. I'm a social democrat. Stalin, Mao, and other leaders of communist countries are among the worst monsters of history. I'm not going to be advocating communism in this. I don't currently agree with any version of communism I've heard argued for. There are YouTubers who advocate for all communism, and obviously the communism they advocate for is a far cry from Stalin and from others. I am going to be arguing against McCarthyism, because I realize that saying that you're either in favor of McCarthyism or Stalin is a false dichotomy. Just for fun, I did a word search. The word McCarthy appears, and this is not an exaggeration, 1,485 times in my notes of, you know, the stuff I wrote to talk about in this and all the, the reviews I copied in. So... If this is something you've never heard of, this is a biography drama history, you know, historical from 2005. It was, you know, George Clooney co-wrote and directed in part inspired by his father being a journalist who considered Murrow his hero. It really captures the intensely fast pace of a newsroom, especially right before going to air. The movie doesn't appear to have been influenced by the revelations in the Venona project. I've seen some criticize the movie for it. I've seen some say that it wouldn't make a difference anyway. Based on my own research, I agree with the latter and not the former. And as such, I'm probably not going to be discussing it in this video. You know, you, you don't have to take my word for it. Re you know, feel free to research on your own. I would never want someone watching one of my videos to just take everything I say at face value. Now, but, but yeah, so this is a dramatization of the historical event. It expects you to know the context already, and it does simplify it to better communicate the message that it is necessary for journalists to challenge what the government does and says. And... As for whether this has been done better before, I'm not sure the topic had been dealt with in a major well-known movie. It's, you know, it's, it's not like nobody knew, you know. Of course, a lot of people knew, although when this came out in 2005, sadly, a lot of people had forgotten. You know, personally... My father explained to me about McCarthyism when I was a child, so I've always known about it, and I've always had a huge problem with McCarthyism. Not with trying to figure out if there are, you know, spies in your country that are working to serve a country that is an enemy of your country, but McCarthy and McCarthyism specifically. Obviously, we need to be aware of, you know, spies and influence from, but yeah, moving on, the movie was definitely worth making. It's one of numerous examples of left-wing Hollywood stars leveraging their influence in order to shine a light on a situation where a person or institution has done something horrible. And, you know, among the problems with McCarthyism, when cornered, he would attack instead of admitting fault. 
he went after his political opponents with little to no proof simply because they were his political opponents. He ruined countless innocent lives and tried to take away people's civil liberties. Good faith criticism should always be encouraged, and we should always look with suspicion on those who refuse to hear criticisms. And this is especially true for those who respond to those criticisms by attacking the reputation of those who criticize them. If McCarthy had accepted and responded to fair criticisms of what he was doing, if he had been more careful to not go after someone without proof, then he would have been able to keep going and might even have been accurate in everyone he accused. Cleverly, Murrow went after McCarthy using his own words against him so that he couldn't argue against it without admitting that at least some of his words were wrong. It reminds me of when Glenn Beck went after Jonathan McIntosh because of right-wing radio duck. He used Beck, Beck's own words. If I had been Beck, I would have laughed it off, do a brief bit on it, saying something self-deprecating. I, I hope I do reach every man, woman, and duck out there. But instead, he called McIntosh a communist. He was literally attacking him while doing exactly what McIntosh made fun of him for, proving his point. Sadly, McCarthyism, although today they don't always allege communism, sometimes it's something else, but in spirit it's the same, today is being imita imitated. Frequently, it doesn't lead to as awful consequences by many con conservative politicians and media personalities, and movies like this can help challenge that. And I know a lot of conservatives are very frustrated that McCarthy was stopped, and there are many other cases of conservatives fighting for a cause where after a while, they had to stop because they were lying, breaking the law, things like that. And I 100% understand their frustration. It sucks when a cause you believe in fails. But I'll tell you what I always tell people in this situation. Don't hate the people who revealed the truth, who uncovered the unlawful behavior. Instead, hate McCarthy. Hate the person who did lie, who did break the law. If his cause was so just, he wouldn't need to lie and break the law in order to accomplish his goals. Hypothetically, let's say that you are a person with almost no power living in a dictatorship. Then it's understandable if you're using illegal methods, dirty tactics and such. But he was a senator in a... I mean, I, I would hope that even he would not have claimed that America was a dictatorship at the time. He had resources. He had legal means of you know, trying to find out the truth about these people, and yet he overstepped, you know, so there's no, yeah, there's no excuse for it. I'll admit I haven't read all of the reviews of this movie that are online. I simply ran out of time. But I will say that I didn't find very many by self-professed conservatives that actually admitted that McCarthy did unethical things. They're much more interested in pointing out that some of the time he was right, I would never claim that there were absolutely no communists in positions of power in the U.S. back in the 1950s, or that McCarthy himself, you know, and the people working for him didn't find any of them. The movie brings up Annie Moss, who was later revealed to be a communist. And to be fair, the movie doesn't actually go into that. And that is... I, I do think that there is an argument... Excuse me. An argument to be made that either the movie shouldn't have brought up Annie Moss or it should have, you know, made it very clear that she was later revealed to be a communist. Now, some conservatives reviewers think that the movie makes it appear that there were no, absolutely no communists in positions of power. And the, you know, the movie doesn't convey that a lot of people were afraid of communists. It wasn't just McCarthy. I would say you do get a sense that there is some truth to the, you know, there is some reason to be afraid of communists in position of power in the U.S. And the movie definitely conveys that a lot of people were afraid of I, It's baffling to me, just like, it's, it's text, it's not even subtext. Murrow specifically says, McCarthy did not create this fear, he simply exploited it. It is unbelievable. Well, I wish it was unbelievable. Just how many conservatives watch the movie and then say, 
that the movie makes it seem like McCarthy was the only, you know, like, just, the movie makes it clear. McCarthy took advantage of it. He didn't create the fear. It would be great if the first person we think of, when we think of American government people trying to determine who was a communist in the U.S. military and government, never accused anyone he didn't like, regardless of how little evidence there might be that they were communists. And because he did, because he started doing unethical things to get the results he wanted, he ruined it for people who would only use ethical means to achieve that goal. Way too many conservatives are entirely too scared to hold other conservatives accountable for their mistakes. If the right will not confront the conservatives who make mistakes, then we on the left will do it. And it's going to reveal that you conservatives are unwilling to hold your own accountable entirely too much of the time. Not always, but entirely too much of the time. And if you're willing to lie to protect someone who breaks the law, then why would we trust you? We progressives do hold each other accountable. We hold the left accountable, even the ones we don't agree with. We don't only go after the other side. This, is, this was also what I was saying before Brett Kavanaugh sadly did become a Supreme Court judge. Conservatives were screaming at these women, especially Christine Blasey Ford, who came forward with these credible accusations. You shouldn't hate the women. They're the survivors. You should hate the person who is credibly accused of victimizing them. If Brent Kavanaugh had agreed to a proper investigation, it would have proved either that he did or that he didn't do it. The fact that he didn't want the investigation suggests that he's afraid that he would be found guilty. I'm, there's some chance that he doesn't even remember, but clearly he thought there was a certain chance that he would be found guilty. Despite all the support straight white conservative men get when they are accused of sexual assault and rape, especially if they're also powerful men, we may never know for sure if he did it. If he really hates how badly it reflects on the Republican Party for pushing him, for him to still become justice, then he could have quietly turned down the nomination. People wouldn't be talking about it anywhere near as much in that case. And in fact, I and many other progressives, we would be saying, good, that's good. You shouldn't push for someone to get that amount of power who might have sexually assaulted someone. That's absurd. There are things that you can't get away with doing that you shouldn't be able to get away with doing. You cannot possibly argue that they couldn't have found another straight white cis man who would fight to kill the right to abortion although obviously some people felt that made him even more qualified. Because even when he was young, he didn't think that it mattered what women thought should be done to or with their bodies. In some ways, the war on terror is worse than McCarthyism. It takes almost no evidence at all to put someone in Guantanamo Bay. I suppose I should comment on cancel culture, since many people would argue that cancel culture is the new McCarthyism. This is a complex issue. I'm going to try to cover all of it as best I can. Not everyone who is referred to as being canceled actually loses their job, especially long term. A number of comedians have supposedly been canceled, but they're still getting gigs. They still have widely seen shows. It's silly to claim that Dr. Seuss and Mr. Potato Head have been canceled. It's simply that the people who own the rights to them felt that they, in the case of Dr. Seuss, were recognized to be racist, which thankfully is getting to be seen as accept unacceptable more than it used to be. And in the case of Mr. Potato Head, they felt it would be more inclusive to make the toy gender neutral. Nobody forced them, nobody twisted their arm, nobody sued them. They made the choice. A lot of the people who were supposedly canceled have legitimately done awful things. And it's extremely important that we believe women who come forward with accusations of rape and assault. I do think that there should be consequences when someone's found to have done something wrong, but I do also think it's important to leave room for redemption. Maybe being cancelled should mean that you have to take a course in something fitting for what you were cancelled for. You know, if sexual assault, rape, or abuse, you know, you should take a course that helps people recognize recognize the the feelings, the, the desires that lead to them doing it and get better at not doing it when they feel like it. And, you know, studying how badly it hurts people who are survivors and 
then have to spend a certain amount of time trying to talk people who are at risk of doing something like that from doing, you know, talk them out of doing it. And after a certain amount of time, the maybe the person who was canceled should try to make a case for why they are now not going to do that thing again. And the people who canceled them and or a psychiatrist should evaluate them based on them making the case and see if they think that person has learned their lesson. If they fail to convince, maybe, you know, they have to do another course, maybe one that's longer and more comprehensive. And this cycle could continue until they eventually prove that they've changed. Or I guess maybe after a specific number of times, let's say 10 failed attempts and making their case, maybe that's when they lose their job or the like. And obviously if they're rich, they have to donate some of the money. If they're powerful, they have to use their powerful position to support the cause that they've worked against. But I do think it is... I think some people are capable of changing and some people could become strong allies of a cause if they legitimately come to see that they were wrong in in the past and i think redemption is something that should be encouraged <clears throat> and that there should be room for ah, excuse me <clears throat> Now, it is extremely important that we call out our own when we see them do something wrong. We should not become an echo chamber, but at the same time, same time we should be careful we don't destroy our movement, cannibalize our own. And finally, let's please not pretend that it's only the left wing who cancel. Conservatives love canceling those that they just love. Ah, excuse me. <clears throat> Sometimes I can come across as if I have very few positive things to say about conservatives. I want to try to set the record straight. I don't have a problem with conservatism as an ideology. I have a problem with conservatives who don't have empathy, who lie, who fight dirty. If you don't have empathy for anyone other than the people that look and sound like you, I f it's, it's just barely empathy at all. If you're a conservative and you don't do the things that I've just mentioned, I have no problem with you. I want to work with you. I want us to make the world a better place together, but I have no patience for those who lack empathy. So this has, you know, the, the IMDb more like this list compared to this to the following movies that I have also seen. Michael Clayton, which I gave an 8 out of 10. Frost Nixon, also 8 out of 10. Confessions of Dangerous Mind, 7 out of 10. And The American, 8 out of 10. Now, I mean, ultimately, I would say, you know, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, that's the same director, and it's also about TV. Other than that, you know, the one that comes, that has the most, bears the most resemblance to this is Frost Nixon, which I will be doing a video on down the line. And I, f I would say they're about equally good. They have slightly different strengths. Frost Nixon really, I, I, it's been a while since I watched it, but I remember that as doing a really good job making you, you know, de developing these characters, which is something that this movie, you know, th this movie doesn't like fail to develop characters. It decided not to do that. And you can argue that that was a mistake, but it would be silly to say that it's, you know, it's clearly not trying. Now, for those who might not know, the title of this movie, Good Night and Good Luck, or Ganaggle if you're nasty, Good Night and Good Luck was the sign-off of Edward R. Murrow's broadcast, both the, the specific ones he did attacking McCarthy and it, the, he started doing it when he was reporting on World War II, and uh, yeah, that's, you know, for that it makes a lot of sense to say good luck. You know, they were at war. They, they had, uh, they, they legitimately feared that this might be, you know, that they wouldn't be able to stop the Nazis, that they wouldn't be able to stop the communists, and that most of the world would become Nazi or, com you know, yeah, you know, ruled by Nazis or ruled by communists. Now, the reason I decided to review this is that 
It is extremely important to push back against harmful right-wing narratives. Movies like this can remind journalists how important their ability to reveal and confront, harm, you know, reveal truth and confront harmful people and institutions. When this movie was made, the idea was for it to encourage journalists to be harsher on the Bush administration, which was early in its second term and really deserved to be called out by mainstream media. Today, I would hope that movies like this can help encourage journalists to confront right-wingers who try to demonize their enemies using extremely dangerous rhetoric. You know, in all three cases, it's we're talking about government overreach. And, you know, today, the, the kinds of things that you hear major right-wing politicians and media personalities say about left-wingers, I mean, I think if you traveled back in time and told George Clooney before he made this movie, that someday there would be people in Congress who believe in QAnon, I doubt he would have believed you. You know, it is extremely important to not let these people completely destroy America. Now, the reason that I first bought this when I found it and... The, the reason I badly wanted to watch it was I was very enthusiastic when I learned that a movie had in fact been made about Edward R. Murrow confronting McCarthyism. I knew about the event due to history class, but a lot of the time people pay more attention to movies than history class, and I wouldn't rule out that, you know, maybe some of the southern states don't even teach that there was something wrong with McCarthyism. I haven't personally seen, I haven't, you know, I have been shown movies in history class, not this specific one, but yeah, I could imagine that, you know, it. There, there are a lot of things about it that make it ideal for that kind of thing. One thing is that you could use it to open up, to allow, let, let the... As, as, an, as an entry point, that's what I mean. As an entry point into discussing the more complex nuances of McCarthyism, which, you know, the movie does, it, it has a relatively simplified, you know, de depiction of it. But, you know, if you, if you show a movie with George Clooney to high schoolers, maybe they'll pay more attention when, you know, when, when they, when they're, when they're told very specific historical things, but, you know, it's, there, there's, there's no sex or violence that, you know, parents of students might be offended. You showed a movie to their kid that had sex or violence. There's, it's, it's not really, it has a very specific point of view, and obviously some people are going to be offended by it, but it's not setting out to offend people. <sighs> uh, you know, I, I suppose if you still, if you in 2005 or 2021 still think McCarthy was a good guy who was unfairly judged by others, the movie does want to offend you. So yeah, this is a period piece and it does really well. It's very convincing. Like, if, if you traveled back in time and you showed this movie to people in the 50s, a chunk of them wouldn't, would, would barely realize that it was, you know, it, that it wasn't made back then. <clears throat> or maybe that it wasn't just a documentary of events. So, the, yeah, by this point in the video, you can already tell that I am approaching this movie from a very left-wing perspective. I'm not sure that I'm necessarily going to make any argument against McCarthyism that the movie doesn't already make, since the movie does such a great job at covering the most important arguments against McCarthyism. If you're open to that and you haven't already watched the movie, definitely watch the movie. I'm not telling you, anyone, to not keep watching the movie. Yeah, not to not keep watching this movie, but if you're not a left-winger, you're probably not going to like very much of what I'm about to say. If you feel like hate-watching, maybe this will be your kind of thing. So this was written by George Clooney and Grant Heslow, and I haven't seen anything else that they've written, but I do think that 
they really understood how to best make it work and they you know it makes the most of the concept the it's it's a very credible movie now i usually talk about plot twists I'm not sure I would say that there are really plot twists in this movie, even if you don't already know the fact of the actual event. It's not really that hugely surprising. It's it's tense because you 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 know, even as you you can you can probably guess a lot of what's going to happen, but you still feel like this, you know, you're you're worried how it's going to work out. I would like to watch more of the movies that George Clooney has directed. I I didn't love D Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. I do love this movie. So the yeah, the these are the only two of his that I've watched. And I'd also like to see other stuff he's written. Now, the direction by George Clooney is very focused and he definitely understood how to make the most of it, and you can tell that it was a passion project. He wasn't a director for hire. So the opening does a really good job of setting up the rest of the movie, and the rest of the movie does a good job of paying off the and, and following what was set up. You know, the very start, we see this... You know, the, the Murrow is about to receive an award, and this is after the events of the film, and that also tells you right away, you know, Murrow isn't going to die during this. This is not about, you know, oh, my, he suddenly died. That's, you know, so, so right away telling you, don't, don't focus on things like that. You know, this is not, it's, it's about the ideas. It's about the, the conflict. It's not about, you know, who, who lives, who dies, that kind of thing. And, yeah, you know, after, you know, we, we see him receive the award and start to give a speech, and then we jump back to see the events of, of the film. The very first thing we see is the crowd at the award ceremony in this brief montage in a celebratory mood. Uh, you know, this is, this is celebrating Murrow's accomplishments, and that also tells you, you know, he's someone to admire in this movie. Which, you know, there, there is a certain amount of gray. The, the people in the film discuss their doubts. They talk about, are we doing the right thing? And it's, it's not, I, I don't, some people say the, the word hagiography hey, has been used as, you know, that this basically, you know, this, this just praises Moreau and, and such. There are several times in this movie where others confront Murrow and say, why didn't you do that? I think I know why you didn't do that. And it's not made out as that being an unfair accusation. The movie is saying everyone is flawed, but you have to fight for what you believe in. And you have to make sure that you're on the right side and you're fighting in the right way. This is also, you know, sometimes when people say you have to fight back against, you know, some people distort that and say, oh, we have to fight back against the political thing we don't like. Oh, okay, I guess we're supposed to break out guns and explosives and try to kill our political enemies. And this movie makes it very clear that's not, that's not what you should do if you live in a, demo in a democratic country where you have freedom of speech. You're supposed to use your freedom of speech. And the, yeah, so, you know, brief montage in a celebratory mood, and the moment that the award ceremony itself begins, they're all silently paying close attention, listening to every word, and, yeah, it communicates very efficiently, effectively to the audience, this is a man whose words matter. And... I feel that the rest of the movie lives up to that promise. I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad. I will say it does, you know, it fits with what came before. I think it does a really great job. It, 
you know, it addresses the, the yeah, the, the things that it brought up earlier in the movie are addressed in the, in the end of the movie, and, I mean, if there's anything negative to say about the ending, it feels like it comes too soon, you know, the movie could definitely be longer, and some have said it does, it's not, they didn't feel like it was big enough, you know, it wasn't, and I understand, but it would, if they tried to make it like this huge climate, you know, like, not huge, but like, if they try to make the climax bigger than it is, it wouldn't really, like, they would have to make up something that didn't happen. You know, the what the movie shows is what happened. It, it wasn't more dramatic than that, and I don't... I think it's good to go into the movie knowing that the ending is somewhat... It's it's not like big. It's relatively subtle. I mean, in some ways, the 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 ending of the movie also does have a message. But and and you know, I I can understand people who say it's preachy. I suppose, yeah, pro probably preachy. But it was something that really needed to be said at the time, and it's disheartening that it didn't lead to much more of a, you know, it, it got really positive reviews, but beyond that, you know, it didn't really, yeah. Now, the movie does not lose your interest along the way. The movie does feel like a tribute to Edward R. Murrow. You really get a sense that the people making this have tremendous respect for him, and they make a really good case for having a lot of respect for him. So, talking about the characters, David Thrust Strathairn plays Edward R. Murrow, journalist and host of the CBS television program, See It Now. The first time we see him, he's accepting an award for journalism, making a fiery speech in favor of gutsy journalism. And George Clooney plays Fred W. Friendly, co-producer with Murrow of See It Now. The first time we see him, he's discussing with Murrow running a story in defense of someone accused of being a communist, and very soon after, he's seen refusing to be pressured by people sent by McCarthy, two colonels, in fact. And I want to join in with the uh, numerous other reviewers who praise Clooney for putting his ego aside. One could have expected him to take the lead role instead of giving it to Strathairn and the the yeah you know this this was not about ego he you know George Clooney's role comparatively is a bit smaller he's not as yeah and the yeah, you know, he, he hired Strathairn because he felt this would be the right man for the job. So Robert Downey Jr. plays Joseph Wershba, writer, editor, and correspondent for CBS News. He's, you know, it's a bit of a calmer performance than some of his 80s and 90s roles. And, you know, today we really think of RDJ as Tony Stark. I appreciate that in this performance... In this movie, his performance is completely different. It wouldn't work for this movie at all. And Patricia Clarkson as Shirley Wurstba. She's also really good. And Frank Langella as William Paley, chief executive of CBS. He's torn between letting Murrow report the truth and the consequences of them telling the truth. You know, something that... Back then, the, the sponsors... Like, if, if the sponsors didn't like the way you were reporting the news, they could just pull back out and not give you money, and you'd be, you know, you'd be in a really bad situation. So that's something that, yeah, the, the movie confronts. Jeff Daniels, 
I liked him when he was funny. I'm really glad that he has since taken more serious roles. He is really compelling in serious roles. And Ray Wise as Don Hollenbeck, journalist for CBS News, accused in the press of being a pinko. You can really tell how it really wears him down that he's been accused. And yeah, you know, others have said it's it's heartbreaking. His yeah. And yeah, you know, this I let's yeah, and Joseph McCarthy plays himself in archival footage. It's very well integrated. If you didn't know that's what you're looking at, like if you watched this movie having no idea there was going to be archival footage, you might not be able to tell, and you might be surprised by just how much archival footage the movie actually shows. Now, let's see. So the... Yeah, so the, the dialogue is sardonic, clever, at times somewhat similar to, like, British verbal wit comedy. And there's some Aaron Sorkin going on as well. To lighten the mood and release some tension, every so often people will joke about either themselves or the person they're talking to secretly being a communist. And at several points, characters will make small talk, and after engaging in that briefly, they will say something extremely important, making clear that the small talk was basically supposed to be a buffer. It was supposed to ease them in to the painful statement. That it really, like, there are a lot of painful realizations here. It, it really does show people were terrified during the, the Cold War. And, again, the movie makes it very clear it's not McCarthy creating this fear. He does take advantage of that fear, but... Even these, you know, the, the movie, the journalists are very careful to not just, like, randomly accuse anyone. You know, it confronts McCarthy with, like, there are things he himself had said that he's since gone against. And so they confront him with that. And that's where, if McCarthy, if he did, in fact, have some decency and shame, he would have admitted, I made a mistake. And, and just, but he was too proud. Some of the characters you'll see, you know, you'll see them in relaxed situations. You'll see them worried that McCarthy is going to destroy their life. So, you know, you get a sense that they're not like always in this one mode. So, the cinematography was handled by Robert Elswith, Elswick, and, yeah, he definitely understood how to handle it. It's filmed almost as though the film was actually made during McCarthyisms, the lenses, the, cam the kind of camera moves used, and there's some, I'm not sure if it is handheld, but it feels as, as fluid as that, and some stark vivid high contrast black and white photography, some of the scenes with a lot of shadow between the, the you know, yeah, if, if there's a lot of, sorry, chatter between newsmen, the camera will pan very quickly as if it's trying to see, I'm able to admit when I made a mistake. Sorry. Yeah, the, as if it's, ju if it's trying to keep up with who just started speaking when in reality, of course, it was carefully rehearsed. And even if there was mad libbing, they could have simply done another take. But it's very effective in putting you right there as if you yourself are trying to keep up with the chatter. And it makes great use of the, like, I, f I forget exactly what it's called, but uh, f rack focus maybe that, you know, you can keep certain things out of focus communicating, for example, that the people who are in focus are not thinking about what isn't in focus, even though it's close to them physically. You know, they're sharing space with it. Now, the editing is by Stephen Marioni. And, yeah, the editor definitely also got it. It's very subtle but effective. It's not drawing attention to itself. 
I saw one reviewer criticize that sometimes the movie will show the journalists watching a clip and then that clip being aired. I understand why they felt this was repetitive, but I find that the tension is increasing as we see the footage. There's a huge difference between considering airing a clip and actually airing it. Again, this was, you know, there were livelihoods at stake. And I'm not sure there is a single special effect in the movie. And if, if there is, if, if there are any, they're incredibly well hidden. And that's really good because it would distract from the story. And I don't think there are any stunts, and again, it's good. It would distract from the story if there were. The production design is careful to keep everything period accurate, and this doesn't really show a lot of settings. It's mostly, you know, it's the, the studio, not, not just literally the, the room that they film in, but the entire, you know, the, the yeah. I think the overall thing is called a studio, where the journalists are discussing stories. Other than that, I mean, we see at least one bedroom of, you know, someone, well, two people that also work at the studio, and there's like a bar where they go to, like, relax. That's pretty much it, and it helps focus the events. The important things either happen there or, you know, the important things were filmed, and then they watched it in the studio and such, you know, and, yeah, I, I really appreciate that it does keep the, the focus so narrow, and the, yeah, so the, the, yeah, McCarthy is the antagonist, and Murrow is the protagonist, and their relationship with each other is very compelling. Again, these are, you know, one of these people might end the other person's career. And the scenes are easy to follow, they're meant to, and I agree with that decision. Now, the... I'm not sure there is any actual score in the movie. It does use some music from the time, jazz, performed by Diane Reeves. Basically, a scene transitions, interludes. It works really well. It fits especially well because, you know, the, the, yeah, on at least one occasion, the music we're hearing is literally something that the radio station is broadcasting at that same time. And, I've, I've seen some say it's too relaxing for the tense mood. I would argue that it works well to give a break from the tension. I think the rest of them, you know, yeah, you know, the, the, the entire rest of the movie is always like the, the idea that people might get fired and might not be able to get another job because nobody wants to hire, no, nobody wants to be seen as someone willing to hire a communist, I I think there's some chance that the movie would have been unbearably tense if not for the jazz interludes. And I realize some people that'll sound absurd. And, you know, usually I watch long, you know, two and a half hour long action movies for, for tension, you know, or, or incredible horror movies, but yeah, you know, for this movie, it, it, obviously it's not the same as the, the, other, you know, other movies, which are incredibly tense, but, I don't know, it manages to be unbelievably tense. Now, the, let's see, So the, yeah, the humor can be this kind of deadpan, sardonic kind of thing, and sometimes we laugh with characters, sometimes we laugh at them. There, yeah, so as I already mentioned, there's no violence, no gore, no sexual material. I mean, 
is there maybe a tiny bit of like like mild to moderate language maybe i think that's the the most you can say and uh, also for those bothered by smoking in movies there's a lot of it in this it's it's very period accurate and yeah the level of realism is very high you don't really need to suspend disbelief to enjoy it the laws of physics apply. There are few to no contrivances. And yeah, it very much feels like it's the real world. The, the pacing is very smooth. By some standards, it's slow. I would say slow in a good way. By other standards, it's very tense and moving, moving quite fast for how much and how dramatic it is. And, yeah, you know, maybe in some ways it's like maybe if the movie came out in the 1970s or something, you know, a political, uh, let's see, I was about to say political thriller, but I guess even that is overstating things, like a political drama from the 1970s. And that, I mean, sometimes it works really well when movies that are made in modern times are set, you know, decades back and they make the movie very similar to other movies from, you know, the, the its contemporaries. But with this, I mean, yeah, like, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in some ways it kind of feels like the movie, the movie comes across as if had it been made back then, it wouldn't have been very different from the way it is. I would disagree with those who say the movie is padded. Some said that the music music interludes are padding. As I already mentioned, I, I feel that they're just they're necessary. And it's not it's not really that the movie is taking a break. It's just, you know, there's less like the plot doesn't move as much you know, during the interludes. We get we get a breather, but other times it moves very very fast and yeah the movie is 89 minutes long and it's well worth the investment of time if you're not interested 30 minutes in the movie probably isn't your kind of thing and Yeah, and as for, you know, whether or not this is offensive, you know, there are conservatives who have a hard time admitting that McCarthy was wrong. Other than that, I'm not sure that it would really be offensive to anyone. And the best element of the movie is seeing Edward Murrow confronting McCarthy, standing up for civil liberties. Now, I try very hard to come up with something negative to say about even movies I love. I realize there was only so much they could do. The movie really does not have a lot of diversity. It's almost all straight white cis men. There's like four women and one of them is black. They're not treated with a lot of respect from the characters or the movie. The black woman is just there to sing jazz and, you know, kind of makes me think about how a while back black people were not allowed in certain establishments unless they were performing music. That was the only way that they would be... Yeah, so that's... And again, I realize it, it would be difficult to change that significantly, but it, it is a little uncomfortable. So, others, when, when I looked at what other people said were the worst thing about the movie, some people said that it's boring, a number of conservatives said that it doesn't do justice to the subject, in their opinion. I, I read dozens of reviews of this, maybe a good, nah, I'm not going to guess exactly how, but you know, several dozens. I did learn something other than the fact that apparently no one knows how to spell David Strathairn's last name. And no, that goes for both the people 
who liked the movie and those who didn't. I'm just saying, Spellcheck did exist in 2005. What? In some ways, yeah, you know, in some ways, the movie is like one made in the 70s, more than one made in 2005. So if you think serious movies that were made in the 70s are boring, you might also find this to be boring. I mean, be long before I watched this, you know, when I was a kid, I did watch a bunch of movies from the 70s, including some that by today's standards would be seen as unbelievably slow. And I really enjoyed them. You know, I've, I've always had quite a taste for older movies. You know, when I was a child, my father would watch, we, we would sit down and watch The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly many, many times, you know. So, and yeah, I think it was my mother who introduced me to Kubrick. And... Honestly, I was probably at least a little bit too young when she started, but you know, it's not like she showed me a Clockwork Orange. I think, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name, Barry Lyndon, I feel like the name was. I think that was one of the ones she showed me when I was a kid. And honestly, maybe in some ways I was a little too young, but it didn't, it didn't like scar me or something. And yeah, so... You know, yeah. Now that I've mentioned that I love Sergio Leone, even his longest movies, and I love Kubrick, yeah, I mean, a movie has to be extremely long and extremely slow for me to not enjoy it. But I can understand, you know, if you didn't that... A lot of people didn't have that experience, so a lot of people might find the movie slow. I don't find it boring personally, in part because I also deeply care about the subject. I think the movie mainly serves as a depiction of an extremely important historical event. It's definitely not made to be a very fast-paced, entertaining movie. It's not like I, I mentioned that the there is there are some you know funny lines and such, but it's not it's not a comedy. It's essentially a movie rather than a documentary, purely because if George Clooney directs and stars in a movie, instead of just having someone make a documentary, more people are going to see it. I, I guess maybe today a lot of people would watch it as a documentary as well, but when this was made, documentaries were not considered as big of a deal as far as star power goes. And you do see a lot of reviewers say, you know, it almost felt like a documentary. And, some of those people are saying that's a bad thing. Some of them are merely being descriptive or even using it as a positive. I, I think an argument can be made when it's about something that is important and where we have a lot of knowledge about what historically happened. An argument could be made that it is better. An argument could be made. I'm not saying it necessarily is. That it is better excuse me, to either make it a documentary or present it in a way, you know, in a, in a way that it feels like documentary, in a way that makes it feel like it was, you know, uh, makes it feel like it's happening right now, since it was something that did actually happen. And I don't think that's true for all cases. I think there are some, uh, there are definitely some exceptions to that, but I do think this was a very smart choice. Now, I was most worried that it might be preachy, and I mean, the movie does basically spell out what you're supposed to take away from it, but it doesn't really... I guess I can't really claim that it's not. Yeah, what I'll say is, it doesn't bother me. But it, yeah. It's, it's, it would be disingenuous to claim that the movie is never preaching. That is not. And, yeah, the thing I was most looking forward to in the movie was Marvel fighting back against McCarthy. And the movie exceeded my expectations. And, yeah, the a lot of very talented people worked on this, so you may want to seek out other work 
of theirs. And yeah, recently in these reviews, I try to go into whether the movie is entertaining to watch or not. And for me, extremely, I guess for people who don't care as deeply and who are less okay with a pace that by 2005 standards is slow, I would go with reasonably. Although, you know, again, if you're a conservative and you're hate watching this, there's a there's a chance it's, you know, yeah, you're you're going to launch out of your chair, fly through the ceiling and the roof. It is a good movie as a whole. The trailer does not give too much away and it does give you a good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailer, you might also like the movie. And if you don't like the trailer, you might not like the movie either. The cover and posters don't give away too much. And they do give a pretty good idea of what the movie is like. So if you like the cover and or poster, you might like the movie. If not, you might not. The movie does not really have a lot of metaphors, difficult to understand elements. You don't need to watch it more than once to pick up on everything that happens. If you do watch it multiple times, you might pick up on little, little, little details that, yeah, that, that you didn't the first time. But it, it's definitely well worth watching more than once. I want to make that clear. But it's not something where you need to watch it more than once to understand. And, you know, that is actually, yeah. Hypothetically, if you watch this once and you feel like you didn't, there were things about it that you didn't know enough context to completely understand while watching the movie, if you go and like, you know, read some Wikipedia or something and then watch the movie again, you might appreciate it a lot more. Now, let's see. So yeah, in, in some of these videos, I go into, like, you know, I, I'll, I'll go into suggestions I have to, for how to fix the movie, or at least greatly improve it, and I'll usually put those in the notes taken before watching section. That isn't really the case here. I acknowledge that there are things about this movie that some people don't like. I can't really point to something that I... You know, the, the closest thing I could, the closest thing I can get to something that I really think is a problem with this movie is, like I said, the diversity. And it is really difficult to, you know, give, given that it takes so much, it's so much of it takes place in the, the studio. I mean, they would basically have had to make a bunch of these journalists women. Yeah, you know what, honestly, I... It wouldn't have been as realistic and as accurate, but I do think that could have been a good, yeah, that, there you go, that's that's probably the only thing I have to, but, but yeah, I acknowledge it's definitely not for everyone, and I do think that, I, I haven't seen them, it's possible they exist, I think there are other ways to talk about, I guess, I'm not sure, you necessarily need a different movie about Murrow versus McCarthy, but you could make other movies about McCarthyism, and they could, you know, they could have a lot of different um, settings. They could maybe show, you know, some, some people said that they wish the movie had shown how bad things were in the 1950s in the Soviet Union, for example, and I agree that is something we should never, ever forget. But I don't think it would have fit in this movie. I, I think it would make... I, I would like a movie that showed how bad things were in communist countries and showed, you know, yeah, showed, showed Americans imagining things getting as bad in America. And, like, like, you could have someone wake up from a nightmare where they suddenly find themselves in a communist country. You know, I... I do disagree with those who say that the movie does make it seem like there wasn't a reason 
to be afraid during the Cold War, afraid of communism. But I do think that you could make a movie that dives deeper into that fear. The, the way it is in this movie, you can always tell that there is that fear, but most of the people you see talk about it are journalists, and they tend to be talking about it in direct relation to whether or not they should be trying to fight McCarthy. And that is a bit, obviously, that is a bit of a difference from regular people looking to McCarthy and thinking that he's fighting the good fight. You know, so, yeah, I, I would like to see others. If, if you know any, please put them in the comments. This has 93 on the tomato meter, and yeah, you know, I, I, I do agree with that. I would say, you know, some, some people said, you know, well, movie critics love movies that feel like, like classic movies, and they love movies that are about, you know, the, the medium of, of films, you know, the, it, it is a movie about television. So, you know, maybe the, maybe some of the reviewers were like, oh man, I love television. I spent years studying television in, in college, you know, oh man, they, they made a movie about television and it likes television. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it says that television can be a great thing. I think if, if not for that, if you asked people who didn't really care about television, it might not have 93 out of 100 on the tomato meter, but it is also a really good movie. Now, the meta, met, on Metacritic, the critic rating is 80 out of 100, and the user rating is 7.3 out of 10. So, yeah, you see that, you know, the and, and on IMDb, it has 7.4 out of 10. So, the critics liked it more than the than, than audiences did. And yeah, the NBA age rating is PG and I think that is yeah, it, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense. I mean basically the only way it gets a, a you know a more restrictive rating than that is if you consider the the cigarette smoking as a bad and you know there's an argument to be made cigarette smoking is something that is very easy for impressionable young people to imitate but you know evidently the the you know the MPA didn't think it was that big of a deal or they would have definitely given it a higher rating they're not usually they don't tend to mind giving high ratings to so yeah and some people say that this movie gives you so little insight that you may as well just read Wikipedia, you know, about the, you know, and, and for sure, if you want more information, the, you know, there, there is, there, there, there's information that this movie doesn't have on Wikipedia that's very relevant to McCarthyism. But I would definitely say that you get more out of watching the movie than just reading Wikipedia about it. But it's a good idea to do both. And I don't think that, you know, when, when George Clooney wrote and co-wrote and directed this movie, I don't think he was trying to lure people away from Wikipedia. You know, he, I, I really do. I think of the movie as an entrance. It's, it's your introduction to this kind of thing. You know, it's, it's not supposed to be the whole thing. I recommend this to people who don't already know what happened in real life that the movie dramatizes. And, you know, the, the, it, yeah, if, if you don't already know the very many of the details, I recommend watching the movie before, you know, unless, I mean, I mean, yeah, you should, you should know before watching the movie that it does, you know, it doesn't give all of the information. So if that's going to color your interpretation of it, read before watching the movie. But yeah, you know, if you're passionate about journalism 
and ab about finding the right way to combat dictatorships, then I think you will like the movie. And I give this eight journalists fighting politicians out of ten. And that brings us to the start of the thoughts section. So from here on out, there be spoilers for this movie without warning. I will warn if I spoil anything other than this movie. So, disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep it short and long, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers since a lot of this is very standard information. I'm going to keep speaking as fast as sometimes to during this section once I get into the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth the time. So, let's see. Yeah, so this video is not very visual. It's not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So, feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab. Since we are still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible I will touch my face. I actually already did, yeah. So I want to say, it, I want to assure you, I washed my hands carefully since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands carefully again before going out. So, let's see. I really appreciate that this movie is in black and white. And, you know, part of it was that, you know, well, if we have to, like, colorize all of the archival footage, you know, so they made that decision, but it really works for the movie. So, content warning and or trigger warning. I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie. Gaslighting, McCarthyism. Right, yeah, the MPA rated it PG for mild thematic elements and brief language, so... Let's see, I'm probably not going to be discussing depictions of violence in this, but just in case, I want to assure you I don't have a problem with violence in general. The thing was one of my favorite horror movies and books in general. Also, Cronenberg's The Flying Video Drum, etc. Personally, I don't think... Oh, never mind. Yeah. So, I might swear some in this video, but probably only very mild, similar to the movie. So, I got this on sale, so anything negative to this is not out of bitterness. I also do not feel like the movie wasted my time, nobody forced me to watch it, make for this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to the, the real life events that it's depicting. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, you know your things to say. In this are for criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Instead of quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here, I loved every line they put in the MVP Marvel quote section, so you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. And now, I, I started recording this video as, you know, right after I was done watching the movie. So yeah, the rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of this analysis some of his MSC DK riff tracks and other jokes. Honestly, I did not end up putting a lot of jokes in this one. But yeah, the, the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts I have while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary like tweeting of like. The section after that is thoughts I have before watching. And the final section is again into stuff I think it's worthwhile to get into on Rhymes, Mike's Metacritic, MDB, and Wikipedia. I am, let's see, yeah, the movie does not appear to have a lot of empathy for the least likable characters, such as McCarthy, and I think that is appropriate. They gave him a chance, you know, they, they, they pointed out how he's going against other, th he's, you know, in some cases he's going against things he said at other times. If he had just said, Mea culpa, nobody's perfect. I'll try to do better from now on. I'll tone it down. I'll try to get my facts straight before attacking people. And 
yeah, so I watched this. I definitely watched this in the year 2010. I may have watched it earlier. And let's see. Yeah, so in total, I've watched this three times, including right before I started recording. So. Once it's only Fred and Murray in the room discussing Milo, you do immediately get, you know, you, you can tell that the treatment of Milo is really unfair. I really like that Jeff Daniels brings up some counter arguments. It was a consideration that was being made. They didn't just suddenly decide to do this and not think through the consequences and whether or not it whether or not to do, and, you know, and one of them brings up everyone's already covering the other side and that they have been offered time to make their case in response to the story. And that's, see, that's where really, like, they immediately, they're like, you know, the, this, McCarthy is a senator, he has this, he has all this power and just him saying a name can ruin that person's life. Of course it's only fair that someone with a platform like Murrow points out, this is ridiculous, Milo Radulovic, the, that case, there's so little, like, he didn't want to denounce his father and his sister who were, you know, reading, you know, the, the kind of, yeah, and, and, yeah, it's, it's completely absurd, and the fact that Murrow, you know, pointed out how little of a, of a trial there was, yeah, you know, it's, it's not like there, yeah, you know, I, I saw someone pointing out, you know, the, the movie basically depicts Murrow as David slaying the Goliath of McCarthy and, you know, some, some have pointed out it wasn't, you know, he wasn't the first journalist to criticize and there were a number of other people who already did have problems. And again, I, do, I mean, the, the start of the movie does say few journalists dared to criticize him. So it is acknowledging that Murrow wasn't the first, you know, it's, I don't know, I guess, to be fair, the, the thing that other people, the people who criticize how much the movie simplifies it, would maybe have preferred us knowing, you know, be, being told in the movie what those other journalists criticizing him were. And I can understand that. And then, yeah, maybe it would make a lot of sense to do, like, a really long, extremely detailed like, from the very start of McCarthyism to the very end of it, just let's go through every single thing that, you know, that, that was important and make, like, an eight-hour miniseries. I'll watch it, and, you know, that will definitely, yeah. But I'm not upset with this movie for not being something it was never supposed to be. It's a good detail that Fred Friendly is sitting so close to Edward that he can tap his, uh, what's it called, his knee to signal that he's alive. It's really powerful when Murrow points out all the people who are not allowed to see the contents of the manila envelope and thus it is almost impossible to defend against the charges. I completely agree with those who say that Murrow definitely couldn't stand doing the fluff interview bits. I had completely forgotten that Robert Nepper, you know, teabag from Prison Break, was the one who handed, handed RDJ the documents. And that, you know, yeah, because this was right around that same time. That show started in like 2004, I think, so... And when I, yeah, all three times I watched this, I recognized him and, 
you know, both after the first and the second time I had forgotten. And like RGJ says, we immediately know that it's preposterous that Murrow is a communist. I really appreciate that Murrow and Paley discuss whether Murrow is handling it right. It's not that Paley can't imagine McCarthy is wrong about some of the people he accuses, but he doesn't believe that reporters should handle it. He thinks that the government will take care of government people stepping out of line. You know, he's, let's see, I think he says that the Senate will censure him, you know, and I mean, I think that is, I mean, ultimately the movie agrees with Murrow, and I don't know if Paley did say, if, if the real life Paley did say this, but the movie is raising that issue and basically saying, no, we can't, as sad as that is to say out loud, we can't trust the American government to hold itself accountable. We couldn't in 1950, in the 1950s, we couldn't in the mid-2000s, we can't in the year 2021. It is extremely important that people with a platform use that platform to criticize when the government is doing something wrong. I really like the discussion about if anyone in the room has ever had anything to do with communists. One of them literally points out, well, you know, yeah, I mean, what was it? My my ex-wife, I didn't even find out until the divorce. Back then, we were, they were our allies, you know, so what would be, you know, it's, it's insane to punish someone for something that you, I mean, if you had, like, like back then, there were prob probably people pushing, you know, communist ideas on, like, like, saying that that you you know you you can't be too disrespectful of uh, you know our our you know our, our fellow soldiers out there you know they're extremely important to stopping the nazis you know and then you know world war ii ends and immediately everything that has to do with communism is now seen as awful even if you only looked into it back when they were allies you know it's 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 like thought crime it's it's absurd you can't punish people for doing something that was legal when they did it that's and one of them brings up whether they read the book and you know if whether they're actually sure that the book is not subversive and Yeah, so I'm I'm not going to quote the entire "We must not confuse dissent with disloyalty" monologue and that problem. You know, I'm just gonna really quickly say I love Murrow's entire monologue there, and that entire uh, program. I think it's called. I honestly don't understand how conservatives can watch this and not realize that he specifically points out that McCarthy didn't create the fear; he exploited it. It's kind of humorous that for several seconds they think that no one is calling and it turns out it was because the phones hadn't been turned back on and like it makes sense that they would turn them off for the show. They can't, you know, they, they need to be, they need to pay close attention. There can't be a lot of, of yeah, but you know, the, the guy who was supposed to turn them back on is like, uh, should, should I, is it okay if I turn the phones back on now? It's okay. You can go ahead and turn the phones back, and then they're just all calling. And let's see. Maybe it's because I know that later in the movie he commits suicide. But when Ed Holland says on the air that he wants to back up Murrow, it's really moving. And actually, yeah, he's specifically criticized for that. And Paley sits perfectly still as his phone rings. It's clear he's not going to like the conversation, and it does have consequences. They literally ask the one woman present to go buy the paper instead of one of the men doing it. As they wait for her to return with the paper, the tension really grows. And Ed asks that the Jack O'Brien review be read aloud, even as Friendly and others realize, uh, I think Murrow is one of them, realize that's probably a bad idea. And, Shirley claims she read the whole thing, and Ed 
you know, impl implores her to finish reading, and yeah, it's it's really you know painful to it's it's yeah. I saw at least one conservative reviewer really try to underline it wasn't McCarthy who wrote those columns, as if the movie for one single solitary second suggests that it was. They say it's Jack O'Brien multiple times. The movie doesn't depict them taking down Jack O'Brien. It does depict them taking down McCarthy just because it depicts negative things done by someone other than McCarthy doesn't mean that it's saying McCarthy was responsible for them. I really wish those, you know, those conservative reviewers would appreciate the irony in them complaining, you know, claiming that the movie simplifies things to make it appear that McCarthy is the only bad guy while they're the ones simplifying things. I suppose they feel they can't defend all of them, so they try to avoid talking about the ones that they simply can't defend. What is McCarthy going to do? Debate himself? We literally just used his own quotes. I appreciate the weight the movie places on the revelation that the Senate is investigating McCarthy. Not to mention the revelation that Ed committed suicide and even after he was still being attacked in the press. And it's it's a very, like... Yeah, you know, I, I guess the, the suicide is just vague enough that, like, the, the, you know, really young audiences might not realize that it was suicide, or at least might not imitate, but yeah. And I do also really appreciate that it is, like, some movies depict really brutal suicides, and it kind of takes away from the fact that it was this person basically giving up. You know, it makes it seem like a violent, like an attack or something. And I, I, yeah, I appreciate the way it's filmed and edited here. I appreciate just how many times the movie brings up journalists doubting and discussing whether what they're doing is right or wrong. And it's very, you know, the, the have you no decency at long last, have you no decency is very powerful exchange and a great cut between that and Moreau tolerating the fluff piece interview. Like clearly he's he's thinking about what's going on with the, the Senate hearing and like, ah oh, yeah, great. I'm so glad you're having this positive thing happen that I'm I'm definitely paying attention to it, yeah. Everybody knew. It is probably very easy to tell if, you know, if a, if two colleagues are married. Like, I've seen many couples in my life. I don't think I've ever seen a couple who trying to hide that they were a couple. But just the way people act around each other is hugely different between colleagues and couples. And Paley confronts Murrow that he didn't want to defend a known communist. I like there, at the end, we don't actually see the reaction of the people who listen to Murrow's speech. Now that they've heard the entire speech. And it is this thing of, like, you know, the speech is almost more for the audience. You know, it's... Uh, the fact that it doesn't show the audience, the, the movie, the in-movie, in-universe audience reacting is because it doesn't want to tell the the people watching the movie what to think about what he said you know they wanted to like land and to to ruminate very downbeat ending they may have won the battle but it's possible they lost the war you know and yeah 16 years after the movie came out sadly i would say an argument could be made that they did lose the war. The movie didn't really inspire journalists to be critical of the government when the government is shutting down discussion of what they're doing by, you know, calling people who criticize them traitors. Now, the, yeah, so without end credits, the movie is an hour and 24 and a half minutes long. And it's 29 minutes with.
and credits. So see notes taken before watching. So let's see. I Yeah, I am skimming through. Okay, here we go. I am aware that the story presented in the movie is not the whole story. Murrow was not the first person to challenge McCarthy. McCarthy was just the most public image of McCarthyism, but he was far from the only person fighting that fight. I think these details would have hurt the movie with their inclusion. First and foremost, the movie is trying to compel the news media to hold those in power accountable. That's why the limit they limited the movie the way it did, they that they did. It's kind of funny how many conservatives write in their reviews that you know of this movie that it rep, that it misrepresents McCarthy himself when literally every single clip of him is of the actual McCarthy. I mostly would claim that they didn't show the parts of the clips that make him look good, but considering that what they you know considering what they do show, there's Nothing you could possibly have said that would prevent him from looking bad. And, you know, the film barely makes any claims about McCarthy himself. All it says is he attacked some of his political enemies by claiming they were communists and abusing his considerable political power to go after them, and that when that was pointed out by a journalist, it led, him to, it, it led to him going after that journalist too. Even though, as the journalist points out in the movie, they only used his own words. So there are a lot of YouTube videos about this. I, let's see, I don't have that much to say. I'm just briefly going to say... Um, yeah, and yeah, so the DVD special features, the commentary track was, is, is you know, both funny and informational. Uh, yeah, they talk about, you know, uh, right, it is, you know, the commentary track is George Clooney and Grant Heslow and Grant Heslow wrote and produced. And yeah, sure, I'll go ahead and say one more time. Clooney's role on the movie was co-writing and directing in addition to the role he played. And they talk about they didn't want to do a biopic of Murrow. And McCarthy not played by an actor since he'd make him look like a jerk, and McCarthy did a great job of making himself look like a jerk. They shot it to be less cinematic intentionally. Although Luc Besson offered funding the movie if it was shot to be cinematic, and I think there is that that could definitely be really powerful as well. You know, obviously like when I think Luc Besson and like historical, like kind of drama, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is his, uh, what's it called? Jeanne d'Arc, the Joan of Arc movie he made, starring Mila Jovovich, and that one is obviously, you know, that one has actual physical battles between, you know, the protagonist and their, their enemies, so that one is easier to make very cinematic, but still, I could imagine, you know, Basically the same movie, but shot to be very cinematic. Now they have a very dry sense of humor. All of Murrow's lines are words he said in real life. Clooney jokes about Batman and Governor Freeze. There can't be another Murrow. They cannot have that same reach and tell that kind of truth, he says. And also, he jokes that he gave David Strathairn the role because he was... The, the cheapest. And despite this being an obvious joke, 
I saw at least one conservative reviewer who had listened to the commentary track and said, oh, that's a great way to make that decision. Dude, he is clearly joking. Do you really think that he... Oh, my... Just, I, look, just because a lot of conservatives don't have a sense of humor doesn't mean that progressives don't, okay? Just, like, maybe, maybe, like, watch jokes many times and try to get used to what a joke sounds like so that you can recognize it when you hear it. Because he, he was very clearly joking. I can barely even imagine, like, if that had been true, that he would just say it just like that and just completely, you know, risk ruining the professional relationship with David Strick there. Anyway, so there is a DVD special, yeah, special feature called Behind the Scenes, 15 and a half minutes. It's all about authenticity, about what the real people were like. Every so often we'll get a really pointed quote by the real Edward Murrow. It's all about the fear during McCarthyism, including the fear of nuclear attack. Edward decided there are not two sides to every story. They were going to prove the truth. And Clooney says, it's your patriotic duty to tell the truth. During the Vietnam War, Walter Cronkite pointed out that it's a civil war. We can't win. And they talk about how the TV news used to be very credible, but have since become too focused on flash. And Clooney says, I hope that this leads to an open discussion. And the DVD also features the trailer, two and a half minutes trailer. It's also online. It's it's great, very, you know, very tense. There's a real sense of the paranoia. I should probably stop very soon. I think I will very, very quickly look at a little bit of the next section. So, Critic Sites, MDB, and Wikipedia. Just gonna really quickly skim a few of them. Now. Yeah, just briefly, the three taglines are, we will not walk in fear of one another. In a nation terrorized by its own government, one man dared to tell the truth. They took on the government with nothing but the truth. And yeah, see, one of if if you go to the uh, parents' guide on IMDb, excuse me, under frightening and intense scenes, excuse me, yeah, so five out of nine found it to be mild, and. Yeah, I'm just going to read verbatim. The character Cinema McCarthy is scary when he rants. The film is intense, and the tension during the film builds up to a crescendo. And yeah, that's exactly how I would put it myself. And... George Clooney was paid $1 each for writing, directing, and starring in the film. And as such, yeah, $3.00. And this helped keep the film's cost low, coming in at a budget of just seven and a half million. Each morning, George Clooney would gather his cast members together and give them copies of the newspapers from that day, 1953. He'd then give them an hour and a half working on old manual typewriters to copy out stories from the paper. He would then hold an improvised news conference with hidden cameras, in which the cast members would then pitch their stories to the editor, just like a real newsroom. You can really tell. The, the movie really gets across that the, yeah, the people in the movie, the actors, again, these are, these are actors. You know, maybe some of them have done journalism at some point in their life, but it's not their career. But it feels real. Initially, the famous concluding catchphrase, good night and good luck, that became the title of the film, was a habit Edward Armour kept from his London years as a war reporter for the radio. Then British people kept, sorry, then British people under constant night German bombing systematically entered their conversations with the very same words, uncertain they would meet again. So yeah, good night and good luck. It's... And... Yeah, see, this is, is, 
precisely every 23 minutes, the standard running time of, of television shows from the 1950s, the film is punctuated by a jazz song performed by Diane Reeves. And most of the text of Edward R. Murrow's speech book ending the movie is taken word for word from the actual keynote address he delivered to the 1958 Rotunda Convention. And let's see. Yeah, and, and the IMDb trivia has a little more of the words there. So I think I will conclude this with briefly noting that IMDb has 545 user reviews, and I also noted how many you could find. So yeah, reviews you could find by going to the movie's IMDb external reviews section. There were 359 total, and I could copy in 151, so the rest are dead links, languages I don't speak, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, that is going to be it. I guess it's very fitting for this movie that this is a very short video, by my standards, at least. But, yeah, I've said everything I really felt I badly wanted to make sure to say. And my back is starting to get a little sore from sitting, so I am going to sign off. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. Good night, and good luck.